Hi, everyone. Welcome back. It's Jonathan Corry from Free Cursive. I'm delighted today to be joined by the legend that is Peter Rubino, uh, the VP for services at Conga. How are you doing, Peter? Fantastic, Jonathan. I don't know about legend, but great to be here. Well, I don't, you, you're good to have a beer with. So, so there we go. Now, I'm you're you're in a you're in a, te- a place called Birmingham, right? That's is that where you live? I think. Yeah, in Michigan. In Michigan, so not Birmingham, North England, so slightly different. Nice. Exactly. What's the What's the university there? Is that University of Michigan? They're a pretty good football school. Yeah, they're about twenty five minutes from here, exactly thirty minutes. Very good, very good. Well, it's great to have you on. I appreciate you joining. Um, so maybe like just to begin with, well, I, I always sort of welcome the guests. We do a little bit of the potted history of their, of their life and times and career. So uh, maybe if you don't mind, you could give us a bit of an introduction to yourself and your role, a little bit about uh, Conga and any interesting career history. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess, uh, so I, I work at Conga. Uh, I had our services team. Our services team is really made up of three kind of uh Portions we've got learning services, yep. uh, we've got our implementation or professional services, and then we've got our managed services. Uh, so I lead that team globally for us. I've I've been in the services space for for quite a long time. Started did a lot of consulting at IBM and um, was in the SAP ERP land for a long time. Before that, I was always automotive, like a good Detroit boy. I was uh, I was born in the automotive uh, and supply chain land, uh, and so that's kind of okay. where I started off. Yeah. So yeah, that's a little bit about it. But if you want to know a little bit about Conga, yeah, Donovan, um, so really Conga is a, uh, a company that merged two different companies together. One was kind of more enterprise based um, and, you know, had a, a big, long implementation cycles uh, yeah. along with a company that was more kind of commercial based in nature and was yeah. more uh, kind of fast paced, high velocity business. Yeah. Um, and so we've got one's those a, two One's like together. a, one's a CPQ product right and then one's more of a clm document management platform is that correct yeah so one was yeah. cpq and clm and then we okay and, and then the other one is clm document management sign um right. and so just to give you a little bit more color of what those are for those that aren't very familiar yep. with this particular space it's all about revenue you know life cycle so if you think yep. about the lifeblood of every company it's about managing your revenue so things like propose and quote so you mm-hmm. want to sell something, you've got to go propose it, you've got to configure it. Is it the right price, the right discounting? Um, is the proposal beautiful and, and hit the hit the mark? Um, yep. Then you somebody decides to buy something, you've got to negotiate it and you've got to execute on it. So you've got the contracting, going through the contracting process. Are you yep. managing the risk? Do you actually know what obligations you have in your contracts? A lot yep. of places don't. And then you've got to manage fulfill. It's all sorts of things kind of mid-flight, uh, there's changes mid-flight in the in the subscription economy. You got to add more licenses. You've got to change the data package, swap X for Y. ERPs right. really struggle with this. And then you yep. have a renew and expand. So as people move into the renewal business, it's all about you know creating larger piece of their business through new sales is actually in the renewals than the new sale. And so um, we we kind of manage all of those different aspects. And what we see is it's getting more and more complex for businesses to operate like this. And, and, and so ERPs and CRMs super struggle. So we solved this problem. It's only eventual, if a company's successful, it's only a matter of time until they realize they really need these, this kind of solution for, yep. to manage their overall revenue life cycle. So hopefully that helps. No, it does. I mean, I, I think it's underappreciated how much that revenue efficiency and operation element actually is a key driver of customer experience, right? Like, you know, that mental point when someone wants to buy something from a vendor, if you're not able to effectively get through, let's say, that contracting process quickly, and anyone selling into mid-market or enterprise knows it's anywhere from four weeks to three months, if you're lucky, uh, any any inefficiencies in that, right, it, it just you're just extending it. And then you're putting even more pressure on the services organization, you guys, right? Uh, you know, because then everyone's so pent up to get their hands on the solution, they want it yesterday. So no, certainly, certainly interesting. I think it'd be nice to get your thoughts on kind of in this new world of service delivery later on about kind of the impact of of services delivery on things like RevRec, for example, right, pulling that revenue forward. But great intro. So thank you for that. Um, One of the things that I like to explore is kind of like how people like you have seen the world of professional services evolve. 
you mentioned you you know started back in big blue so we won't go that far back but if you if you sort of look look back over the last five years which includes of course the pandemic which we've all been through how have you see, seen things change what's what's kind of what, what's been the landscape looking like and how's that evolved yeah so I mean, there's a lot of obvious things I would say, you know, you have a much more remote workforce, you know, yep. everybody's kind of adapted to the fact you can kind of operate more remote and not always on site. A lot of what's happened because of that is, you know, people have dispersed and you have a lot more equalization of pay versus the regional based pay models and, and the fight right. for talent and in hiring people in, in, in uh, India to support, you know, uh, EMEA and all, all sorts of things around the globalization and the fact that people don't need to be on site as much. Yep. But the other things we've seen is, you know, I think in our legacy world, a lot of services, and I'm, I'm going to focus on services here because yep. I think that's your, your focus of your customer yep. question. You know, we really fell into two different models. You had high growth organizations that were like services, just give it away. It's a necessary evil. It's got to be done, you know, and, and grow ACV at all costs, even if that includes giving services away, right? Yep. And so that was a big model. And then the other model was you were past that, you got kind of past the hyper growth model and you were into the, let's call it a bit of the cash cow mode, right? Where it was yep. services, deliver margin at all costs, right? If you can't deliver a solid margin, don't do the work. You know, and even if that resulted in some CSAT issues or whatever, you've got to deliver the margin. What I see happening when I talk to my peers, what I see happening at Conga is it's all about the flywheel, right? And so when we talk about the flywheel, you know, happy customers and our, you'll hear from our, our executive team all the time, you know, happy customers renew more, yep. they buy more, yep. and they refer more, right? Yep. And so we're all about generating happy customers and with a balanced view of growth and margin. So how can we balance the flywheel of success with the growth and margin? It's a very balanced view. I think you can see that happening in the market dynamics today. You know, yep. you got to be able to deliver with margin. You can't just give everything away that, yep. that, and then, and then making those trade-off decisions um, to not just, you know, do whatever you want, having a margin kind of component to it forces good decision-making. And so that's really the that's really the concept that we see out there is you know you're hiding problems if you just give away margin you just you just hide problems rather than shining a light on them so you've got to balance that but I will say the fundamental principle of what I see in organizations is the success of our customers yep and so that that starts with the sale it goes all the way through the delivery and and into the support and maintenance models that is the foundation that all of our decisions are made on. Um, but it's, it's a balanced view with growth and margin. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, I think the, you know, the, the point around the globalization of services as well and, and with remote delivery, it sort of, it, it creates a lot of opportunities. It also creates a lot of challenges in terms of team engagement, in terms of, you know, how, how kind of managing workload, right? Because, a lot of people can just work all hours because they just get up and start working and don't stop. Um, I think it's been interesting from a delivery standpoint as well. One of, one of my friends who works in a consulting firm at Salesforce SI, he said, you know, it used to be that we would fly out on a Monday, do workshops, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, maybe Thursday, take the client for dinner and then fly, fly back, you know, and that was, you know, that was it. And you needed yeah. that week. And if something happened, like someone couldn't make it, there was a key person on either side, like you've got to reschedule that week, right? And it's expensive. Um, but now what they're doing is they're sort of taking those three days and that's all being spread out maybe across virtual sessions. So in a way, the logistics of some of this remote stuff are easier to manage. And then in a way, if you think about that from a capacity planning perspective, it's like, well, actually, three days is kind of easy to like organize, but like a few hours here and there, like dispersed into everyone's schedule, that's way more challenging, right? So yeah, it's, uh, do, do, does that resonate at all? Oh, 100%, way more challenging than that. And actually the, the harder problem I see with it is that week, you know, that kickoff week that yep. used to always happen, right? And then yep. the workshops, it wouldn't just be the week, you know, typically the first month you'd be a lot more on site in these these engagements. Yep. You know, you 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 build trust and you build that, trusted advisor relationship 
Yep. And you, and, and part of that's the work that's actually done. Part of it is the socialization before and after, right. And the water cooler and the, and the dinners. Yep. And it, it is something we actually have to spend a bit of energy on is how to build that same kind of rapport and relationship over zoom. It's not very easy, no. right. It's, it's actually much, much harder. And so that's something that we're challenged with as well. Yeah. Well, exactly. Our, our relationship blossomed over a beer, right? Like it's just, <laughs> it's kind exactly. of, yeah, in real world. So, so going back to the structure of the business, it sounds very interesting because you, you've essentially, if I understand correctly, you've got an enter, you've got, you started with one, you started in a business with one product, a very enterprise product, CPQ, CLM, and then you've acquired it or merged with another company. Um, is it an acquisition, a merger? Yes, yeah, it, 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 it was an acquisition, but yeah, acquisition. We, it, it's mostly okay. merged. Yeah. Okay. And, and so now it sounds like you've got quite different sort of, um, dare I say, it, different products, different markets, different delivery models. Is, is that fair to say? Yeah. So we, we've really set up our organization. So we've had to, to deal with this and it's been interesting and we've had learnings and we've gone back yeah. and forth with different structures. The way, the way we've done is we, we have regional, regional, regionalization of our implementation team. Right. Um, and so the first thing we do is regionalize. Well, there's enough, our business in, in, in Asia Pac and EMEA is small enough in our kind of commercial segment, if you will, yep. that we're able to, you know, just dedicate some small capacity to those teams, but actually do yep. the enterprise through strategic and, and commercial altogether. Yep. Um, in North America, we've got enough, you know, business that we actually differentiate it and it, it needs to be differentiated because the, the operating model is very different, right? You've got these long, you know, dedicated resource projects, right? Where you've yep. got a team of potentially 10, 20 people that are all right. full-time dedicated on an engagement. That is a much different operating model than one person supporting 15 different customers, you know, yep. coming in and out. And, and, and in the enterprise space, you'll have customers that are, you know, they've got a timeline, they've got to hit that timeline. It's a dedicated job for the engagement manager and the, the product right. owner, et cetera. Well, in the commercial space, you've got one hour a week of, <laughs> a, you know, this is my side hobby because yeah. I got to figure out a way to be scrappy to get this implementation done so that yeah. I can get this done. Well, the, the timeline pressure is different between the two and the urgency is different between the two and the governance is different between the two. So you have to operate those businesses very differently. And so we've, we've really segmented those businesses to be able to operate differently. But then we have... Uh, but we're supporting them, you know, we, we surround them with the same things. So we give them operational support from one central operational team. We give them, we have an innovation team or center of excellence is probably a better term to think about it, where yeah. we bring, you know, new product enhancements, training, enablement, um, right. all these things we bring. And we, so we surround all the teams with some uniformity, um, yeah. but we let the businesses operate independently because they are that unique. So that's kind of how we've kind of organized to, to deal with that problem. Fascinating, fascinating. I think I think that will resonate with a lot of people that out there where they've got you know different product lines. They maybe got an on-premise offering. They've got SaaS offerings. You know, it's 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 definitely that way of the world. I think a lot of the the companies that are growing up, if you will, they're starting with more of that what we call this high-velocity services delivery motion, which is that you know one-to-many uh, that you described, and then yep. there may be depending on their evolution, graduating into the world of enterprise and, and the, the more enterprise nature associated that you described with, you know, the different types of governance and structures and all of these types of things. So no, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I think balancing the two must be quite a challenge for you, must be place fitting. Yeah. I don't know which would be harder, you know, uh, uh, you know, having an enterprise background and trying to figure out the high velocity business or having the high velocity business and trying to figure out the enterprise, but they're definitely unique and it's, it's yeah. fun to watch the, the, the dynamics. I bet. So you've got these different services uh, uh, offerings. So you've got implementation professional services, you've got learning services, you've got managed services. So it sounds like you've also got a little bit of a background in sort of building some of these services packages and offerings. Would that be fair to say? Oh yeah, we've got uh, we've got a ton of experience uh, doing that. So this is this is for me. This is a very hot topic at the moment, right? Because I think what companies are essentially trying to do is 
if they don't have them, they're trying to standardize, right? Like, so if they're at that stage, they're sort of trying to standardize things. And then I, what I see across mid-market and enterprise companies is they're either trying to refine them and make them better, or they're trying to develop new things, or they are trying to rebrand stuff to make it uh, more repeatable. So I, I'm curious, kind of like, just broadly, what's been some of your experience for this? Like, why do companies do this? And sort of what's the kind of 101, if you will? Yeah, so I think, so we've got a number of different ones. So I'll, I'll describe the kind of packages that we've built or offerings we've built. And then I can yep. tell you a little bit about why each has been built. And, and then I can give you some learnings. But the, you know, if you think about the service offerings, we've got, you know, one, which is a reoccurring model, which is the managed services. So this is about, this is about, you know, how do you help customers? One of the biggest problems we see with, with customers in the enterprise space or in the, in the, in the high velocity business is do they, are they set up to manage this software? Well, maintain it. It doesn't matter how great you implement it. If you don't have a process to maintain it, administer it properly, it all falls apart, right? And you start back from scratch and you're trying to deal with it. You've got to develop that engine in the SaaS world. You've got to, there's always new innovation coming. They're getting pushed. How do you absorb that? How do you take that? And how do you keep refining so your solution doesn't fall to the bottom of the list and you you feel like the solution's wrong? So we've built a managed service offering, which helps us solve that problem to give customers a support of experts that actually stay up to date, know how to use this stuff and, and administer these tools for our customers. And so that's that's a big one. And we, we push more and more that way because it's a reoccurring business. So it's really good, you know, from a services yep. perspective to get to that model. Yep. The second one we had was we had a lot of customers that were saying, you know, we really, customers have learned over time that, you know, the industry has learned over time that you don't want on-prem, super complex, customized solutions. They can never can never evolve. They become extremely difficult to maintain. And at some point you're stuck and then you've yeah. got to do something. And yeah. so customers have learned, okay, we're not that unique a business. Help us, help us do this the right way, right? And get the thing yeah. stood up quickly. So we've built high velocity time to value offerings that are really a fixed methodology, a fixed scope. And the in the and the whole idea is to say, if you start off with everything, you'll replicate your existing solution. Mm -hmm. So don't do that. Start off with something really small, get fast time to value, find a scope, find a business unit that we can get in there and get quick and, yep. and get you something stood up with a very fixed approach. We call it an accelerator. Yep. And the way okay. we've built those is, you know, six to eight week kind of implementations, get in there, get, get built out, get it done. And we've had a lot of success doing that. We've had a lot of learnings from it. But one of the things we've done is we have a base model and to make it flexible because different customers have different needs, we have add-ons, right? So just think of a, you know, you buy a truck and you want a different color, or if you want to add a tailgate, or if you want, uh, if you want to add the, the, the extra sound system, we've got those kind of options and bundles that you can buy to, to, to make the experience um, flexible to different customers. Uh, we have learning services packages, you know, that different ways to operate. We've got what we call a PSOD, which is customers just need some help, but they don't know what to do. We call it professional services on demand. They can just buy a book of hours um, and they pay up front yep. and then they can get yep. help with that. We've yep. got health assessments where we can go in yep. and, and, and offer that. And then we've got partner support packages where partners implement our software too. Sometimes they need help or assurance that the implementation is going right is the design sound. Uh, we've got, we need a little bit of help because we don't do this every single day of our life. And so we, we have those. So we've built all of those via SKUs. Yeah. So you can buy those via SKUs, not time and material, not negotiated SOWs. It's on an order form with fixed terms, fixed agreements. And so that's kind of how we've, we've built out. And we, we see that business dramatically growing compared to our time and material business. Okay. I bet. Very interesting. Yeah. I mean, we have something called expert on demand. We have our onboarding services. I, I like calling it onboarding services rather than professional services. Um, I think there's something to do with the labeling and the language of these things is really important, right? There's, there's the, like the emotion that it evokes in, in customers. 
we have, I hate to say it, a phase, in, a step in our implementation called Hypercare. It's being gotten rid of that name. But my, uh, when, my, when our CCO Graham joined, hi Graham, he will be listening to this. He was like, what the f is Hypercare? <laughs> Did you come up with his name? And I was like, nope. I'm like, a technical person came up with that name because we're quite a technical person who developed that methodology. But I was just like, no one wants to be in Hypercare. Like, that's like, oh, this is going to be, this is going to be tricky, isn't it? So no, it's, uh, I think that that's really interesting. It's interesting, the partner support packages, actually. That's very interesting because I think a lot of companies, like the philosophy, isn't it? It's like you build services, you do it in-house, then you create this partner ecosystem and then you farm out a load of partners and everything's, you know, gravy whereas in fact the route to that is much more tricky than than one would oh, expect yeah. so do you the partner support you sell to the customer but it's supporting is that sold when you do the deal or can it also be sold for an in-life customer that's worked with a partner you know it, it can happen after the fact we our position of it and normally is sold with the software right um, okay. and, and, yeah. and the idea is really protecting the customer to make yep. sure that they're getting exactly what they need and the solution yep. will scale, will maintain, be maintainable, et cetera. Okay, cool. Well, I um, I, I know a, a number of the sales folks in, in Conga. Shout out to Mr. Mark Dunn in Europe, who's a fantastic human being. Um, how, I think the sales enablement piece of this, of these packages must be very important because you're quite a large, large organization now. Can you talk me through like, what are some of the, learnings best practices tips and tricks that you've got around like the sales enablement of this yeah of these i'll hit on two things i'll hit on two things for you one is you know the the sales enablement and two is just some lessons learned in building these packages the first thing you know in in, in learning these we've had some big learnings in these packages one is yeah you're never going to make them perfect so roll right. them out just build yep. them roll them out you're going to take some hits you're going to take some problems just iterate yep. You know, you're, you'll take some some margin hits, etc., and you'll have to add some price. You'll have to reduce some price because they're not selling. You know, and you'll have to add some more hours here or there. You'll have to modify some terms. So, just I, my suggestion is keep it really simple, get it out the door, and then iterate. Um, and then the other the other piece of advice on it is do whatever it takes to make the first few successful because yep. the brand of that offering, both internal and external is all dependent on those first few. So do whatever it takes, even if you take a bath on them. And then, you know, from a sales enablement, you know, I would say there's two sides. One, how do you get your, ser your services sales team to be able to understand it and sell it? So there's natural inclination to just do some really solid, you know, education and enablement of them, what it includes, how to position them. Yep. But probably even more important than that is the license team, right? So you've got your, your, your license sales team. So we've had a bunch of sessions to do enablement. And one of the things we do is we really understand, it's really important, how are, how are salespeople motivated? They're coin operated, right? And so, you know, knowing that and understanding how their comp plans work and then building into their comp plans appropriate incentives to, you know, sell these packages, right? And make yep. sure that the customer's set up for success. So we've done that. Yep. We've built in kind of incentives into their plans to make yep. sure that they include the right, you know, services package. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we've done enablement and I'll, I'll tell you just like anybody else, but I think it's even worse for this group. You, you can't say it one time. You got to say it like a hundred times for them to actually <laughs> get it. So, you know, we just, it's, it's like a, it's like a repeating motion of enablement. Uh, you just constantly go, you know, it never stops. It's not a one-time event. It's, it's an every month event. That's interesting. Okay. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of good learnings there. I'll summarize some of those up at the end, but that's, that's really interesting. I mean, I think the, the, the commentary that you're made, making around getting it out there and iterating, I think is you can procrastinate with these things. Um, I think there's a baseline quality that you want to have around you know, your documentation, yeah. um, uh, you know, around thinking through, for example, if you're doing an implementation package, people are very inwardly focused. It's always like, what are the steps that we're taking? How much effort are we going to use? And you actually need to do that for the customer as well. Because that's, that's what they ask when you start talking about it in a call. It's like, okay, who, who am I going to need and how long does that take? So if you build that into your documentation, you start curating for them in the pre-sale stage this is what you're going to need. 
and it will differentiate i think your brand is something that we do and and, and, it, and it works well because it's quite it's quite an elegant approach but i, I like some of those learnings um t- turning now to a slightly different topic um and i think i'm interested in this with you know given what we sell spoiler alert part of it is around operational efficiency um so ps operations right professional services operations or services operations i should say for your for your organization how important is that in running your scale of organization because you've got what three four hundred people now i would imagine yeah about yeah. 300 you know plus okay. contractors but, so how how important is that that operate that operations piece i mean I think you're setting up a a, a ball on a tee for me, but I've, it's obviously uh, it's obviously massive, right? Like, yeah, yeah. You can't you can't run this business without without a really solid operations you know team and the systems that support it. You know, if you think about it, uh, you know, you got to do planning, budgeting, forecasting, optimal resource management, contracting. You know, you got to be able to measure all these things to see what's working, what's not working. You know, where's your margins? Where's where's your CSAT? Yeah. And you've got to be able to operate in the, 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 you've got to be nimble and agile in, in running these things because that's just the way our, our business yep. is running. And you've got to be able to operate between that high velocity business and in that yep. enterprise business. And in order to do that, all those things, you've got to have a really strong operations team and you've got to have a really strong operation system to allow you, you know, to, um, you know, operate in this, in this world where it's, it's more, there's more complexity every single day from when I started my career a long time ago to where I am now, the complexity is, is, is a hundredfold, right. And in, in, right. in operating. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that complexity rising is, is really interesting. Do you feel like there were looking back? So looking, take a moment to think about looking back, what are kind of the inflection points really for you or for others to think about when you should start investing in dedicated people for PS operations, because it starts generally as a part of like the head of the team's role, right? So when when do you think are sort of the inflection points when you need to start bringing in those initial, the initial ops team? And then are there other inflection points when you need, feel you need to scale it out? Is there a ratio of ops people to services people, for example? Yeah, I don't like think that. we've ever, I don't think we've looked at it quite that way, but the inflection points that I've, that I've seen is, you know, if you think about startups and if we go through the startup journey, right. And I've been, yeah. been part of a little bit of that is, you know, you start off with engineering doing the implementations, right. And, yeah. and everybody does everything. And at some point along the way, you need to say, actually, I need engineering to focus on our product. And yeah. I need somebody that can, that can build a scalable way to implement, you know, this or onboard in your terms, how, yeah. how can we onboard these customers in a scalable, repeatable way and we can't keep doing it with rocket scientists that built the product, right? And so yeah. how do you go about doing that? At that very point, you decide you need a services leader. Um, yeah. And when you do that, that's the inflection point to get operations in. I, I don't yeah. think any, I don't think, and I, I think if you surveyed my peers, I don't think any of them would say, I can run a solid services business without an operation, you know, person sitting next to me as, as my lieutenant, right? And yep. so I think that that's it. Now, how does, what the inflection point when you get your PSA in and when you get the, the, the tools, yep. I don't really know that, you know, my guess is, you know, when you start getting a team of about 25 or so, you probably really need yep. that. It's my guess. Yep. Um, you, you would probably know that better than I do. But it's that, 20 usually. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. So right in that ballpark, it just becomes yep. too hard to manage the different projects, what they need to do, how to build them, you yep. know, the, the forecasting, you know, you get the revenue recognition issues early on. Right. And, and so when you tie the services, you know, to the rev rec of the license, obviously that becomes, and, 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 and that's a big evolution in the, in the, in the space is just the yep. SAS model and then tying services to yep. the rev rec you know, with the 606 and, and, and all yep. that, you know, you really, yep. uh, you really need operations to help you figure that out. Um, and, yep. and so that would be my answer. Cool. All right. A couple of other quick questions then. So, so, you know, you've seen, I mean, you're operating in the Salesforce ecosystem and I think there's a certainly a forward thinking ecosystem around customer success, which is great. How have you seen the worlds of professional services and, and customer success kind of converge? Because, there's a lot of blurred lines between the two now. So what do you what have you seen there? Yeah. 
I mean, there's a lot. Um, you know, my counterpart, we work with uh, extremely, extremely close. Um, yeah, I bet. The first one is, you know, it depends a little bit where renewals sit in organizations. A lot sit with CS, a lot sit with sales. But we have, um, you know, our sits with our with our CS organization. So we have reoccurring services, right? Yep. Those reoccurring services are on are renewed, right? And so that's that's the first point of making sure that you've got tight alignment on the forecasting, the 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 you know, the planning of the resourcing, et cetera, et cetera, around that, yeah. making sure that we're built in with the price increases, et cetera. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the next piece is just around, you know, when you think about the flywheel that I was talking about earlier with the evolution, right? The flywheel is we've got to have really good outcomes and those outcomes, you know, build equity early with your, with your customer. And so yeah. what does that include? It includes quick time to value, right? And so how do we work together with our services organization, deliver that time to value while building up, you know, that that success, which allows us to expand in those accounts and allows us to drive adoption. And so, you know, we, we work from, you know, end to end on making sure that we understand the customer's KPIs, understand their business case, and then we can hand that into the CS organization to make sure they can flow it through. Um, okay. We also try to drive a lot of growth um, of our services organization um, through our CS channel, right? They are the ones talking to our customers. So okay. we help, we use them to help us drive pipeline, right? Where we can, where we can drive things that way. We do a lot of work with journey mapping, you know, the onboarding work, improving the CX experience end to end and making yeah. sure that those things kind of touch together. Uh, so our operations teams between the two, they're, they're constantly, you know, connected at the hip and understanding, you know, you know, between whether it's Gainsight or a different tool and your PSA, how do they talk well together and, and you can get a full, full visibility from end to end. Yeah. Okay, cool. Finally, then you were touching on some of them there, things like time to value. What are some of the metrics that matter to you and why? So what are some of those key kind of KPIs that you use to look at the health and health of your, your organization and in turn of your customer, for example? Yeah. I mean, just like, any other, you know, services organization, it's going to drive, you know, it's going to be built on bookings, billings and margin. Right. And so, you know, we're going to, we're going to look at those. And when you, you try to look at leading indicators, you've got book to bill ratios, your backlog. Um, you look at margin, you look at ADR, our average daily rate and utilization numbers. Of course, those are key numbers. When I talk about that flywheel, we talk about kind of four metrics that we look at around that obviously CSAT of the services. Yep. Um, we look at tri- and we do that via transactional MPS um, approach. Yep. Uh, we look at time to value and adoption um, yep. metrics because uh, they're 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 critical to driving your you know net retention, your net renewal uh, rates. And so we're all incentivized based on 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 a couple of metrics around NPS and, and uh, net retention. And so right. we all look at we all look at those uh, and and drive those, and that's kind of a company wide uh, mm-hmm. metrics. And then there's the people, like we're a people business, right? And so we've got employees, sat and attrition, right? And so we absolutely look at those stats and, 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 and KPIs. So we try to take that balanced scorecard kind of approach between, you know, the financial metrics of the business, the, you know, the, the CSAT metrics of the business and the employee side of the business. And how do we put all those things together? Very elegant. Like that. Love that idea. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. Brilliant, brilliant show. Lots of interesting insight there. I think just to kind of summarize some of the things up there for everyone. I mean, I think, you know, you know, globalization is a double-edged sword, right? Globalization, remote working is a double-edged sword, as as you talked about, right? You can create these regionalized models if you're a global business or if you're expanding and there are certain advantages to that. But, you know, it is an, it's, as you say, linking back to your metrics, the employee experience in that in that world is going to be tremendously important, and you've got to invest in that. I think the way you talked about um, the way you talked about like complexity rising in professional services and sort of having to navigate that um, is interesting from the perspective of like kind of thinking about. I think for companies to think about their own maturity model to know that this complexity is coming. The generally the bigger that you get the more companies you acquire. And therefore, I think that role of operations, if you're going to be an acquisitive company, you're going to be a global company, you need to start getting that in place sooner rather than later. Um, I love the idea of, you know, part of the mission in services is building that equity with the customer, 
I think that's great. I think that, I, I love that. And I also like the language around, you know, how you think about the labeling of these packages, where they're orientated, how they're driving value for the customer, but also stickiness for you um, and just keep it simple and iterate. So thank you, sir. As expected, this is why I wanted to get you on this show for so long. Really good. So thank you. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, absolutely, John. It's always a pleasure to, to, to talk to you. And uh, I do hope we get another beer soon. And uh, to all your listeners, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for thanks for listening to me. And I, uh, yeah, I really appreciate the time. Brilliant. Thanks, Peter. All the best.